Hey guys, welcome to the first tutorial on Apache Cassandra. So Apache Cassandra is a distributed database. So in the context of computers, a database is basically somewhere where we want to store data persistently. So somewhere where we can push a record, such as an employee in a business or a sports team's performance, and have that stored there persistently. So it's always there we want to access it. Distributed basically means that the database is available on multiple computers at once. So we can talk to one computer, get data from the database from that computer, talk to a different computer, get different or possibly the same data from that computer instead. So this tutorial series assumes no real prior programming knowledge. It would be good to have some kind of computer science or database background just to help understand some of the terms we'll use. So terms like normalized, consistent, things like that. So that would be helpful. But you can obviously look them up as you go along and I'll do my best to explain them as I go. We'll give some examples in the likes of Python and C Sharp, but most of the work will be conceptual or will be done via Cassandra's own query language called Cassandra Query Language. So why would someone want to learn Cassandra is a question that kind of comes up quite a lot. So at the moment, Cassandra is widely used in, in tech firms. We can see here on the website that it's used by the like of CERN, which is a science organization in Europe, I think eBay, the online auctioneer, GitHub, I think Netflix used it quite widely. It was also developed in Facebook, so Facebook used it quite widely as well. It also, a lot of surveys suggest that it's one of the highest earning tech skills in the world. So we can see here from a survey from infoworld.com that Cassandra has an average annual salary if you have good Cassandra skills of 147,000 American dollars per year, and that's actually the highest salary in this survey. So we can look at what else there is, Salesforce, network administration, electrical engineer, uh, big data. And I think there's also some more specific skills towards the start, um, Jira, Cloud, Azure, Spark as well. And obviously Cassandra is the highest one there. So that's obviously a good sign as well. So Cassandra is also used to solve some pretty interesting problems, mainly because of it. it has really fast writes. So we can write a lot of data to the database really quickly. And that helps solve some kind of interesting problems. It's widely used in the big data world, for analytics, it's quite heavily used. And for also for stuff like Internet of Things or IoT, where we've got a lot of devices writing a lot of data very quickly, Cassandra can be very useful. It also finds a lot of use cases for time series data. So when we're concerned with the time the data comes in and we want to be able to query all the data between certain time ranges, Cassandra can also be very quick and very efficient in those situations. Another interesting thing about Cassandra is that it takes a column oriented approach to storing and querying data. Most traditional databases that are relational, like MySQL and Postgres, take a row oriented approach, which in certain circumstances can be quite inefficient. So Cassandra's columnar approach can really gain certain benefits in certain situations. So we'll just briefly look at what this means as an introduction to columnar databases, but I'll also leave it a link to a great video on column databases in the description for you guys to check out in your own time. So this visualization here that I've done in Excel represents what we might see in a typical column oriented database table. So this is an employee table and a table here just represents the database representation of a thing in the real world, in this case, an employee. So we can see here that there are a number of columns in the database. There's an ID, a name, an age, a gender, and a car. And while traditional row oriented databases will store the data in rows like this, Column oriented databases tend to store each column in a separate file on a disk. So that gives the advantage that we can just access the columns we're looking for for a particular query. So we're, if we're only interested in the name and age columns, we only have to access those two columns. In a relational database, if we want to access a name, we have to go through every row that we're interested in, even the data we're not concerned with. So we can see that in a column oriented database, it's like a two dimensional key value pair. So each row has its own ID and then each column within the row has a key. So in this case, the name and then the value in this case, Brian. And then again, the next column has a key and a value in this case, age is the key and 21 is the value. So the columnar database gives some advantages, which we'll just quickly show here. For instance, as I said earlier, we can just access the columns that we're interested in, which speeds up our queries. It also helps when we want to compact the data. For instance, if we look at this gender column, we can see that there's a lot of data duplication. 
what column orientated databases sometimes do is that we can replace these here with something like the gender M by four. So this stands for that. The next four rows, including this row, will be all gender M. And we can do the same for female. So this process means we're storing less data on disk and the database is overall more efficient. Another interesting thing to see is that a column oriented database allows for certain rows to not contain data from a particular column. In this case, the car column, we can see that some employees drive a BMW and other employees drive an Audi. In a relational database, these would have to be filled with null or some sort of void statement, which would mean that we're storing something on disk and filling up room on the disk with basically nothing. But in a column oriented database, we don't have to store anything there, which saves even more space. So to finish up this video, we'll just take a look at some of the attributes on the Cassandra website that are the kind of advantages of Cassandra. So they're all, most of them are listed here. So we've got fault tolerant. So it says here data is automatically replicated to multiple nodes. So this means if a single node or computer fails, we can still access our data. So we won't ever lose data. If part of the network is down, we should be still good to go. We should be still operating. Performant, as we said earlier, Cassandra is super fast decentralized so there's no single point of failure so if you've got a uh, cassandra set up with 10 nodes if one of the nodes go down you can still operate there's no reliant on a sort of master node that controls everything every node is independent of each other it's scalable so we can see in this example here there are some really big examples of a cassandra scaling to a huge huge size of storage and throughput apple there has 75,000 nodes and 10 petabytes of data, which is huge. And again, Netflix having a pretty impressive size cluster. It's durable. So as just like fault tolerant, the data is always persisted. It's elastic. So we can see that the read and write throughput both increase linear. So if we add new machines to the cluster, we're getting the benefit of the whole new machine. If we have 100 nodes and we add a machine, we're getting good benefit. In some databases, if you have a hundred node and you add another machine, you're not actually seeing the full benefit of that machine. But Cassandra, we're always seeing the elastic benefit of every machine. So thanks for watching this video, guys. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment. So we'll be back next video and we'll look briefly at the CAP theorem, which is central to distributed databases.